Well, I think as we continue this series this morning, it's only right to follow up and close this series with a message on the judgment seat of Christ. This is why we spent so much time looking at acceptable service, because uh, we believe there's one day um, in the future where Jesus Christ will, uh, with each believer, uh, evaluate the works uh, that were executed while we lived on this earth. And so I want to take a little bit of time looking at the judgment seat of Christ this morning and just encourage you to keep your, your finger in about three different passages, because we'll go back and forth multiple times. It was the passages that Luke read for us this morning. Um, 1 Corinthians 3, you can put a finger there, uh, put a finger in Romans 14, and then put a finger in 2 Corinthians 5. And we'll, like I said, we'll be flipping back and forth a little bit. One of the things we want to do uh, as we introduce the, the topic of the judgment seat of Christ is to understand that, you know, the Bible speaks of multiple judgments. And, you know, it's, it's important to understand the, difference, the differences in the judgments and, and not only who's doing the judging, um, but who's being judged and what's being judged. And, and part, of, part of the reason that this word judgment gives me concern when we're looking at the, the Greek word is bema, which we'll look at in more detail. Part of the reason that the word judgment gives me concern even describing that judgment is because typically when you and I think of judgment, we're thinking um, of our legal system. We're thinking of, of severe consequences or condemnation even. And um, as we're going to look at today, I don't think that's the best description of this judgment. I don't think it's accurate, actually. And so we'll kind of look at why that's the case. Um, but one of the things we've got to make sure we understand is that, uh, especially between two judgments, um, this is different than the great white throne judgment. We've got to keep that distinction in mind. You know, the great white throne judgment is going to happen after the end of the millennial kingdom, and that's only going to involve unbelievers, those throughout the, the history of the world who have never put their faith in Jesus Christ. That's what that judgment is for. And there's only one verdict that's going to come out of that great white throne judgment. It's guilty and the consequence is being cast in the lake of fire. And you can read about that in Revelation 20, uh, starting in verse 11. This judgment seat of Christ is something different. And so we want to look at this today and and kind of analyze this in more detail. Uh, And before we do, I think it would be wise to look at the definition of rewards biblically Um, Because there are rewards that are promised to believers, and rewards are earned. You know, salvation is a free gift, but rewards are something that are actually earned. But how are they earned? Well, they're earned by utilizing the gifts, spiritual gifts that we've talked about, the resources that God has provided for us in the Christian life, the Spirit of God, His, His method of freeing us from sin's dominion. All of those are our resources that we have. Um, And we want to use it, these in the right way at the right time with the right internal motivations and dependence. And when that happens, the good works that we perform will be evaluated as acceptable. And that's the whole reason we're doing this series is to, when we stand before this judgment of Jesus Christ and we've got our, our good works piled up, that more of them will survive the evaluation than less of them. That's, that's the goal. That's the ultimate goal. And so when we talk about rewards, Understand that they're earned, but it's not because you're just out cranking out activity. It's because you're doing activity. You're walking in the good works that God has called you to walk in, depending on the resources that God's provided. So it's everything we've been looking at the last eight weeks um, will be concluded um, at that evaluation, if you will. And so let's look at a couple of historical backgrounds. I'd mentioned to you these are the three verses um, passages that we're going to look at. And, um, you know, this is one of those teachings in scriptures where um, there's not as much detail as you'd like to have. Let's put it that way. Um, there's some detail that's given, but it wasn't like Paul devoted a chapter and said, let me explain to you in detail how this day is going to look, how it's going to work. And he just starts going step by step. But, but these are the passages that seem to describe what we're looking to understand, which is who's being judged, what's being judged, why are they being judged, et cetera. And that's what we're going to look at today. So again, have your fingers in these verses as we go on. But this word uh, translated judgment seat in our passages that we'll look at is one Greek word. Uh, You'll hear it referred to as bema or bema. Bema is actually the 
the proper pronunciation, but who cares, right? It's all Greek anyway. So it's Bema or Bema, either one of those will work. And I many times go back and forth, but the proper pronunciation is Bema. And the word itself simply means to go up or ascend, okay? Nothing, nothing magical in the meaning. It just means an elevated platform. Um, and so it was reached by steps. This is an example of a Bema in the city of Athens, okay? It's in ruins, but you can see that there's some steps here up to a platform, and that's, that's a Bema, okay? So it's an elevated platform. Now, why it's significant is this. There was a couple of uses in the Roman and Grecian world at the time. One of the things that, uh, that we see even played out in Scripture, in fact, the largest use of this word in Scripture is this meaning that we're looking at right here. It was known primarily as a seat from which a judge passed a sentence in a legal case. Okay, in fact, weeks ago on Easter, we looked at uh, the sermon that Paul gave on Mars Hill or on the Areopagus. Well, that was a, a form of a bema in the city of Athens where they would judge legal cases. But we see this word used with Pilate, Matthew 27, 19, and John 19, 13. And this is how it's used there. While, and speaking of Pilate, while he was sitting on the judgment seat on the bema, his wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with that just man, for I've suffered many things today in a dream because of him. And so Pilate was sitting on an elevated platform, getting ready to pass sentence in Jesus's legal case. And that's how that word is used um, largely in the Roman world. That was a pretty common um, definition of the word. John 19, 13, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat. There's our word, Bema in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And so just wanted to give you a couple of examples of how this was used in the Roman world as, as a elevated seat where somebody made a decision on a legal case. Now, what's unique to us, and I, and I believe to our topic of the judgment seat or the bame of Christ, is a secondary meaning that was also used in the Grecian world. And that is, it was a, a seat upon which the appointed judges sat as they observed athletic contests and awarded prizes to the winning contestants. Okay, so you've got one use in the Roman world <clears throat> where it was a legal sentence. You've got a secondary use in the Grecian world where it was actually the judges who observed athletic contests and then passed judgment or, or made sure people followed the rules and then awarded prizes to the victors. And so what's interesting about this meaning I believe is that when you look at the way Paul uses it, in fact, your fingers are in, are in three places right now, if, if you're holding your place. Two of those places in, is in the book of Corinth. Uh, you've got one in 1 Corinthians, you've got one in 2 Corinthians. And I think it's significant that Paul um, uses this illustration to explain how this is going to work at the judgment seat of Christ. And so let's look at some of um, these uh, interesting connections, if you will. Um, what we've got to understand is that during Paul's day, there were four great Panhellenic, if you don't like that word, it's too long, Grecian, Greek, um, athletic games in Paul's day. There were four of them. In fact, one of them, you know, it's been going on since Paul's day. The Olympics happens every four years. It happened every four years, all the way back into, I think, 700 BC sometime. It's been going on. I might be wrong on that. Uh, don't quote me, but this was one of those games. What's interesting about it is there is another set of games, athletic games, one of these fours happened every two years in Corinth. It was called the Isthmian Games. Okay, and so there was this <clears throat> athletic games that happened in Corinth every two years where judges would elevate on a bema and then judge or evaluate the athletic contest as they went on. And so that's, I think, very important to understand because Paul was probably present. You know, we, we find out in the book of Acts that his stay in Corinth was 18 months. And so as we do the math and try to project where Paul was on, on timeline and history and when these Isthmian games happens, he was probably present for these games during his 18 month stay. And so he probably had firsthand experience observing how this went. I believe this is why he goes to this as an illustration of the judgment seat of Christ. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that you, you learn about the Isthmian Games, you know, the, the Olympic Games, we, we know all the events that happen there because we watch it every year on, on TV now. Imagine them thinking back in the day that the Olympics would actually be on something called a TV where the entire world could watch. But 
Um, what's interesting about the Isthmian Games is they kind of had their own set of events, and many of those events focused on combat sports, boxing, wrestling. They had something called, which I'd never heard of until I started studying this, they had something called pancreton. And you think MMA is new. No, man, this is, a, this is, back, this is back in the Isthmian Games. This was like a, a violent hand-to-hand combat, no gloves, no pads, just go after it until somebody submits. And that was part of the Isthmian Games. And so you see that these games were, were big in combat. And so it's also interesting, we'll look at another passage later in 1 Corinthians 9, what does Paul go to as an illustration? He says, well, I don't, I don't, I beat my body into subjection and I don't box with the air. You know, he's, I believe he's referencing these games. These were a, a combative set of athletic games. And so that, that's just some background on the Isthmian games. Now, what's really interesting about these games is there's some uniqueness to these that we wouldn't expect in normal athletic contests that are unique even to the Olympics that, I, again, as we get into the judgment seat of Christ's passages, I think they're going to be helpful to make these connections for us. And so what are some of those qualifications? Well, in order to participate in the Isthmian Games, you had to be a citizen. You could not be a slave. You had to have citizenship. You had to have pure Greek parentage, pure Greek parentage. You had to be a free man. And then finally, you had to be a moral man, not a criminal. Now, that would eliminate most athletes in our day, probably, (laughs) unfortunately. Um, But this was true of the Ithmian Games. Now, I don't know in a Greek or Roman culture how you determine morality. I mean, the standard, the bar must have been pretty low knowing what we know about that culture. But that was, would be how they would determine who could participate in the Isthmian Games. Another thing that's really, I think, interesting as we come out of these games, oh, just in terms of summary, so citizenship, freedom, purity of life were requirements. And then obviously bodily strength and expertise were essential. I mean, you didn't just pull, uh, you know, the, the library nerd out of the library and say, well, man, he's a citizen. He's got all this. I mean, he had to have some kind of athletic prowess too to survive uh, performing against these world-class athletes. And so all of these things had to come together in the participants. Here's what's really interesting, which I think makes it unique amongst other games. Do you know that each contestant that participated in the Isthmian Games, they had to be involved in 10 months of rigorous training under the direction of the judges. Isn't that unique? That, that doesn't happen in our games. You don't, you, don't, you don't train with the judges. You train with your coaches, right? And everybody's got their own personalized coach. You know, even like USA Gymnastics, they've got a coach of the team. And then each one of those girls have their own personal coach, right? You, 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 you don't get trained by the judges, you're getting trained by the coaches. Well, in the Isthmian Games, they would have 10 months of rigorous training that the judges put them through. And part of that training involved, obviously, physical and athletic training. Some of it involved dietary training. They would put them on a special diet so their bodies would perform at peak levels. They would give them a, a solid understanding of the rules. If you leave this lane, you're going to be disqualified. If you throw this type of punch when your, your opponent calls for a timeout, you're going to be disqualified. So they had to get up to date on the rules. And so they would, they would verse them and, and teach them about the rules. And then they would provide the equipment needed to perform at a high level and succeed. And so this was all part of the judges' roles in the Isthmian Games. They were part trainer, and then they would convert uh, to be a judge. And then what we know from the Isthmian Games is that the winning athlete had to appear before the raised seat, this bema, of the umpire in order to receive the victor's wreath. And one of the things they, they looked for is not only who won the contest, but did they perform according to the rules or did they break the rules? That was the deal. Did they break the set of requirements set before them? Um, in winning this match or in winning this race. And so um, they had to appear before this raised seat to get it. And once they got to the raised seat, they received a victor's wreath, a a crown, if you will. But it wasn't uh, a crown that had worth. You know, I've heard of Olympians who take their gold medal and and years later when they fall in hard times, they they just hawk it off on the internet or go sell it to a pawn shop because 
the, the metal itself is pure gold. It's got value or silver or so on. Um, the wreaths they gave here had no intrinsic worth. In fact, they were just made out of leaves, pine, pine leaves, I think, is, is what they're made out of. And so although the wreath didn't have intrinsic worth, the fact that a wreath was placed on their head, people appreciated the worth of the person who earned it. Who, who succeeded, who, who won the contest, if you will. And so the wreath was, as Paul will say later in 1 Corinthians 9, it's a perishable crown. It's, it's a crown that in, in 15 years probably still wouldn't be here. You know, it's funny. I remember years ago going through a, an old book that I think I had seen at a, uh, at a bookstore, and inside the book was an old dried up rose, you know, and many, I remember um, in, our, in my high school, many of the girls that went to prom, they would keep their corsage and put it in a book. And then you just wondered what it looked like 30 years later. Well, I actually saw what a rose looked like 30 years later, and it was falling apart. Well, that, that would be similar to this wreath. It was a perishable wreath. Um, it looks something like this that would fit around their head. But here's the, here's the thing that we've got to understand about the Isthmian Games. And again, this is kind of to lead us in and give us a cultural background as we look at the Bema of Christ. Here's what's true. The judge rewarded the winners, but he did not whip the losers. He didn't sentence them to hard labor. He didn't punish them. You know, imagine if you went to the Olympic Games and as the, the three people who are standing on the podium and you got first place gold, you got second place silver, you got third place bronze, they're playing the national anthem of the first place winner. And behind the scenes, the other nine people who are participating in the race, the judges were out back beating them into a coma. That would make headline news, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, that wasn't the issue at this judgment seat. The issue was not punishment or condemnation or hard labor or forced servitude. No, the loss here was a very uh, real loss. They didn't get rewarded. They didn't get the reward that they could have gotten. So imagine, I mean, we, we see stories of heartbreak with Olympians all the time, don't we? Because they've trained and trained and worked and pushed their body to such limits. They've qualified in every way possible. They arrive for the Olympic Games. They're ready to perform. And the practice before they perform, they twist their ankle and they can't participate. And your heart breaks for them. You know how much they've been through. So there is real loss there. It's just not punishment in the way that we think of, of punishment. So how does that help us as we transition to the judgment seat of Christ or the bema of Christ. And I think what we need to do is answer the question first, who is being judged? Is, is this a judgment for unbelievers and believers? Or is this just a judgment for one or the other? Well, turn with me uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3 and we're going we're gonna to actually start in verse 9, but we're going to kind of pick up uh, really the significance in verse 11. But just to kind of build up here, in verse 9, Paul says, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. And he's talking to the Corinthian believers here. Verse 10, According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. Verse 11, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, okay, and we'll keep reading that passage in a second, but I think that gives us an indication who is building on this foundation, who is going to have their works evaluated. It's people who have the, their foundation is Jesus Christ. In other words, it's believers. And so um, we're going to see that from uh, some other passages too, but it's clear that it, we're not talking about unbelievers when we talk about the bema of Jesus Christ. We just read 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 12. They're building on this foundation, this one foundation of Jesus Christ. In other words, they're saved. These are, these are saved people that we're talking about. If there's any doubt, look at what happens at the end of this evaluation in 1 15, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. 
so as through fire. And so no matter what the outcome for each one of us is at the Bama seat of Christ, no matter how many works stand the test of the evaluation, rest assured your salvation is not based on your works. Your salvation is based on the foundation of Jesus Christ. In fact, has anyone ever seen a house completely burned to the ground? The walls aren't there. The toilet's not there. The kitchen sink's not there. The studs uh, in the bathroom and the bedroom aren't there. But what typically remains? The foundation. And so that's going to be the case even at the, the Bema. And so there's some encouragement there, but understand that these works are going to be evaluated. Now, I want you to also notice, uh, we're going to go to the other passages now. Go with me to Romans 14. Romans 14, 10. And 2 Corinthians 5, 10. And again, we're just trying to uh, establish the case that the, the Bema of Christ is for believers. It's for believers. So Romans 14, uh, 10, Paul writes this, but why do you judge your brother? Okay, and he's not talking about a familial brother. He's talking about a brother in Christ. Why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For, notice that next word, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, so it's we, it's, it's something that Paul includes himself with these believers. We all. So how many believers are going to appear there? All of us. All of us. Along with Paul, along with Peter, along with any other believer in the church age that you can think of, they're going to be there as well. They're going to be there that day. So he includes himself with believers. We see the same thing communicated in 2 Corinthians 5.10, where he says, um, actually go back to verse 9, in 2 Corinthians 5, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing uh, to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And so we also see in both passages the use of the word all. And so all believers are going to appear uh, at the Bema and have our works evaluated. And so um, I've kind of given that away a couple times, but what is being judged? Well, um, I think it's really clear. So we've, we've dealt with the who, we're dealing with the what now. I think it's really clear that what's going to be judged at the Bema is our good works. And do you know that, that theologically, almost uh, every orthodox, well, that's probably too, too, too big of an all-inclusive word. But do you know that theologically, most orthodox Christians would agree with the statement that our good works are what's being evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ. But have you ever found that it just in talking to people practically, do you know what, you know what tends to creep into that day? You know what tends to creep into people's thinking in that day is the sins of believers. As if, as if there's going to be some condemnation or judgment or evaluation of sin that we've committed in our life. And so I want to just encourage you as we look through these passages, see, see how focused Paul is on explaining what's going to be evaluated there. It's, it's not our sin. And, and the reason we know that is because our sin has already been judged. When did that happen? Well, that happened 2,000 years ago when, when a man named Jesus Christ climbed the hill of Golgotha and died for your sins for you. See, he's already paid the penalty for your sins. And if Jesus Christ said, it's finished, I've paid it all, what penalty would remain to pay for you? What would, the, what, what would be left for you to pay? And so we want to just carefully look at the scriptures here uh, as it relates to what is being judged. And I think what we're going to see is it's pretty clear that the believer's works are being judged. What I want to do is I've kind of got those out of order. I want to look at 2 Corinthians 5, 10 first. Uh, so, so keep your finger there. Or put your finger there and, and then put your other finger in 1 Corinthians 3 because we'll kind of uh, go back there in a second. But 2 Corinthians 5.10, again, just looking for what's going to be judged for the believer. What's going to be evaluated at the Bema? 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive things done in the body according to what 
he has done, whether good or bad. Okay? So it's clearly things done in the body. It's, it's works. It's actions. That's what we're looking at. We'll come back and deal with the good and bad comments in a second. But just understand that that's what's going to be evaluated. What is done in the body? What are we doing? And then jump back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's look at it there as well. 1 Corinthians 3, 11, again, he says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, notice this next comment, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So what's being evaluated there? I mean, he repeats it twice, each one's work, each one's work, their, their activity. And this is what we build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, if anyone's work, which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. And so you see that word work repeated three or four times. In that passage, it's clear that that's what's going to be evaluated. Now, here's, here's what's interesting about 1 Corinthians 3 is, is simply this. These are all good works, at least in the believer's mind. The, this is, in fact, this is something that you see in verse 12 that believers are strategically building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And so for the believer, when they show up, Uh, The day of the Bema, they're going to have a stack of of good works, or however that's going to look, and they're going to say, those are all good works. It's not, you're not stacking your sinful actions on the foundation of Jesus Christ to be evaluated. That's an easy evaluation. They're they're worthless. They're no good. Sin is always worthless and no good. And, And there's also no penalty or need to evaluate that because sin's already been condemned in the work of Christ. So we've got a stack of good works that you and I are building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. We think that they're all good, but what ends up happening? They're evaluated. Well, who's doing the evaluation? We're not doing the evaluation. Jesus Christ is evaluating, and he's evaluating what? Well, we see from the passage, he's evaluating the quality of the works, the material. You might say the source of these good works. I mean, they all look good to us, but are they all going to be acceptable? See, that's the whole reason we're doing this series. That's, that's the whole reason, because if we think that our Christian life is just about stacking and piling up good works without any concern to source, without any concern of depending upon the Lord, without any discern, concern about trusting in his resources, that's all our stack is going to be. And the second he takes an evaluation tool to it, it's, gonna, it's not going to stand the test. That's, that's a problem. And so we don't want to show up on that day with that mindset, not aware that that's what's going to happen. And so while salvation is a free gift, rewards are given on the basis of one's uh, faithfulness in the Christian life. And what do I mean by faithfulness? Again, uh, it's not just doing things. It's faithfully executing the good works that God's called you to in Christ Jesus, created you for, utilizing the resources at your disposal, not doing them in your own strength, not just going through the motions because that's what your Christian friends do, but actually being mindful of what you're doing each and every moment of your life, desiring to be in fellowship with the Lord. And this is what we're talking about. And so uh, although it's a gift, there takes some, some active faith to be faithful in the Christian life actively choosing to trust the Lord. We're not going to, in default mode, walk in the Spirit. We're going to have to actively trust in the Word of God and the promises of God and the Spirit of God to do so. And so that's an active faith that we're talking about. In fact, there used to be a sign in in regards to this quote, it's kind of funny, um, at Dallas Seminary in the registrar's office, and it it said, salvation is by grace, graduation is by works. So, you know, get your grades in kind of deal. And so, um, in, the same, in the same way, similar way, salvation's a gift, but rewards are earned. Rewards are earned by the quality uh, and the source from which you live your Christian life as you engage in good works. What's equally clear here is that the believer's sins are not being judged. You're not going to find 
the believer's sins being brought up uh, in terms of being judged. Why is that? Well, the daily double, right? <laughs> Those of you that watch Jeopardy, uh, some of the younger people may not know that game show on TV, but um, double Jeopardy, we, we have this concept in our legal courts. And what is the concept? That once uh, somebody is found innocent of a crime, they can never be tried again. You can't be tried twice for the same crime. And so our sins were dealt with on the cross of Jesus Christ. That, so that penalty has been paid. That crime has been satisfied. That consequence has been fulfilled. So what consequence would, re, would remain for our sins? I mean, do we believe that Jesus died for our sins, past, present, and future? And so if he, if he paid for all those sins, what consequence could be left for us at the Bema? And, and the answer is, is none. Otherwise, we would have an unjust God who's executing justice multiple times on the same crime. And, you know, one of the great words of the Bible, although it's a long word, and you might not remember what it means, it's a great word. It's the word propitiation, propitiation, depending on how you pronounce it. But regardless of how you pronounce it, it means that God was satisfied. His wrath, his justice was satisfied in the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is why when we appear before the Bema, we're not fearing whether or not he's going to cast us into hell, that's not, even a, that's not even a possible outcome at the Bama seat of Christ. In fact, he goes on to encourage us in 1 Corinthians 3.15 that even if your work is burned, you're going to suffer loss, but you yourself will be saved. You yourself will be saved. There's that encouragement there. This has nothing to do with your salvation. And, you know, in contrast, the great white throne judgment nobody's going to come out of that judgment saved because that's for unbelievers. And they also are going to be judged on the basis of their works. But we know from other passages, Isaiah 64, 6 being one of them, that if you're an unbeliever, that all of your good works are like filthy rags. They're not going to get you anywhere in terms of righteousness with God. And so you don't, an unbeliever will not have the righteousness needed to get to heaven. I don't care if they mound up to the heavens uh, stacks of good works, they're not going to be acceptable to God. And that's a different judgment. That's the great white throne judgment. So when we talk about the Bema here, um, sin is not even in the picture. Now, sin might enter the picture in one sense. And how is that? Because the works that you do from your sinful self, whether it's self-motivation, self-aggrandizement, you want people to think well of you, it's coming from a selfish, sinful source. Yes, those will be evaluated as unacceptable. So in one sense, that's how it enters into the equation. But in terms of facing condemnation for our sin, it's not at this judgment. It's not at this evaluation. So we've looked at who, we've looked at what, why. Why are believers' works being judged? Well, let's go back to um, 1 Corinthians 3, if if you're not already there, and and 2 Corinthians 5. It's clear from here that they're going to be an evaluation. That, that just doing good things is not what God is after in your life. Just going through the motions is not what God is after in your life. In fact, those of you who have been in Sunday school in, in, in the book of Jeremiah, do you know that the, the people of Jeremiah's day were worshiping in the temple, were offering sacrifices according to the Mosaic law? Now, you say, well, And God was saying, you know what? In fact, he he makes a funny comment in Jeremiah 7. He says, you would be better off not burning your sacrifice. Just cook it and eat it. At least you could get some physical nourishment from it because it's not doing you any spiritual good because you're not internally right with me. In fact, we know the people of Jeremiah's day, not only were they burning sacrifices in the temple and and trying to follow aspects of the Mosaic law, they were also bringing other deities in the temple. They were bringing idols into the temple. They were leaving the temple service and going up the hill and sacrificing their children to Molech. And they thought it was okay. Yeah, I said, hey, religion, man. That's where it's at. And I'm going to make sure to do as many religious things as I can do. So I'm going to worship this God. and I'm going to worship this God. And I'm going to worship this God. And oh yeah, I'm going to come back to the temple and worship the Jewish God too. And they, and they put it all in there. And so uh, when, we, when we talk about this evaluation of good works, the source is the key. We've been emphasizing that in, ser- in this series. It's not just doing religious, acceptable Christian social things. It's how are you doing it? 
Why are you doing it? Upon whom are you depending while you do it? Et cetera, et cetera. That's what we're looking for when it comes to the good works and why it's being judged. You know, John 15, 5, Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing, right? 1 Peter 2, 5 says the good works that we do, we do through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21, it, it uses that same phrase. The good works we do through Jesus Christ. See, it's a source issue. That's why there's going to be an evaluation because not every good work that we see as a good work is a good work or an acceptable work in God's eyes. We've got to understand that. And I hope it helps us be more mindful in in why and when and how and what is our motivation when we do things in the Christian life. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15 uses the concept of different materials. It brings out the fact that there's a different quality or value of the materials that will be tested or revealed by fire. And, and this is clearly more than just our good works present. Good works are present. It's, it's which good works are going to stand up against this evaluation. This, this, this quality control, if you will, at this judgment or this evaluation by Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 uses the word good and bad. Let's, let's go back over there. I think that's uh, worthwhile looking at again. 2 Corinthians 5.10. And I think Paul sums it up well in verse 9. He just says, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Now, he's talking about specifically being present with the Corinthians or being absent from them, but you see his mindset as he lives life. Wherever he's at geographically, whatever's going on geographically or circumstantially, our goal is to be pleasing, well-pleasing to him. And part of that starts with recognizing that you don't have to be in a church building to be in fellowship with the Lord. You don't have to be doing something spiritual to be in fellowship with the Lord. And I say spiritual from a from a Christianity, churchianity use of the word. All I'm saying is like, you don't have to have your Bible open to be in fellowship with the Lord. You don't have to have your head bowed and your eyes closed to be in fellowship with the Lord. You can be in fellowship with the Lord when you're washing dishes, when you're cleaning a pot and pan, when you're changing a diaper, when you're going through the the millions of mundane things that we do on a daily basis in our life, don't separate the spiritual from the mundane. It's intertwined. And you can enjoy the Lord in whatever you're doing, even studying and taking exams, you know, for all these college and high school students in here. I mean, I know that stinks, but you can be in fellowship with the Lord even when you're taking an exam. And go figure. How cool is that? And so this, this is not what we're talking about. So it's, but in verse 9, he says, it's, it's our aim to be well-pleasing to him no matter what's going on. And then notice verse 10. Again, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the th- things uh, done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And so what is he talking about there? Is he talking about sin? Um, I don't believe so because the word that's translated bad here uh, means unacceptable or worthless. And it, and it was used of rotten or spoiled fruit. And so if you, even if you take the, the idea of fruit bearing, okay, God produces the fruit. John 15 tells us we simply bear the fruit. But as you talk about fruit bearing, imagine stacking a, a, a group of fruit, your service, your good works before the Lord Jesus Christ on judgment, and he's going to evaluate which one of those are ripe and good and which ones are spoiled or rotten. That's the evaluation that we're looking at. And, you know, many times there's certain fruit that from the outside it looks really, really good. And, you know, so many times that, you know, even in our life, we may put a, a good work up there. We may not actually think this, but we might man, that, I think that's going to last. That looks pretty good. And you don't know there's like a worm crawling through the middle of it. It's nasty. It's rotten from the inside because your motives weren't pure or or some other factor. You weren't depending upon the Lord's resources. You were trusting in your own self-reliant strategies to pull off something. And although the whole church responded and said, wow, what a great person. When you put that shiny apple up there, Jesus is going to say, there's a worm in that one. Sorry. That doesn't, that doesn't stand the test. And so when we talk about whether good or bad, we're talking about valuable. 
Is it good fruit? Is it rotten fruit? And I think sometimes uh, for us in our life, we, we may not even know. Uh, I think we, we, our aim is to be well-pleasing, but that day will reveal what was done uh, that was lasting and for his glory. So how does this work? Well, we've looked at a couple of things. Um, Ephesians 2.10, God desires for us to walk in the good works he's prepared for us to walk in. We've looked at that verse a number of times in the last few weeks. Um, we also see from Philippians 2 uh, that not only does God have good works that he wants us to walk in, but he's also, uh, he will give us the desire, the will, and the ability to do those very good works. And he's going to do that as we appropriate his grace, as we tap into his resources. And so uh, more specifically, how do you look? How do you find that balance, right? Because I, I talk to people many times, and when they hear uh, this concept, well, the Christian life is just a walk of faith. I say, yeah, you just got to trust God. You just got to walk by faith. You don't want to do anything unless you're trusting God. And the, the visual image that conjures up is, is of a, a, a person at home, uh, laying in bed in their pajamas, um, eating cold pizza, watching reruns of MASH, not doing anything, just kind of, um, that's an old reference, I know, um, but, but not doing anything, just laying there. I'm just waiting, I'm just trusting the Lord. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do, uh, I, when, as soon as the Lord moves me, I'll get out of this bed, but right now I, I don't wanna move because I'm just trusting the Lord. And I had an old mentor of mine who, who a, a young man actually told him that, and he said, well, you need to trust the Lord and, and get your butt out of bed. <laughs> and, and in his case, he needed to start filling out applications for a job because that was what he specifically was trusting the Lord while watching MASH reruns, eating frozen pizza. He wasn't filling out applications for jobs and he was just gonna trust the Lord for a job. He said, okay, well, you can trust the Lord, but get out of your bed and start filling out some applications too. And so there's, there's this combination here. There's this source of, of walking in dependence upon the Lord, but also engaging in activity. And I think we see the, the combination here from, from Paul uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of places. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but notice, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. You see what, you see what Paul just did there? He combined those two aspects of walking by faith, walking in dependence upon God's resources, but also appropriate activity that flows out of that dependence. You know, what's int really interesting about this passage when you look at the context, when he says, but I labored more abundantly than they all, you know who they refers to? The other apostles. <laughs> that, that means Paul is, Paul is confident that, you know, if, if Peter's working 60-hour work weeks on this gospel thing, I'm working 80. And if, and if John is up around 75, I, I'm working 80. I'm... I'm laboring more abundantly than they all. And, and just so that he reminds himself that it's not him. What does that next phrase say? Yet not I. What does that sound like? Well, it sounds like Galatians 2.20. The life that I, I, yet not I, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. It's, it's not I, but Christ. And Paul had this, this understanding, this, this energy where, and we see this next one he uses in Colossians. He says, to this end I labor striving. And if you just stop there, that is the, the vision of much of Christianity. I'm laboring, I'm striving. It, I think the word labor or striving, one of those comes from the Greek word agonizomai. It's where we get our word agonize, agony. I mean, that's, that is working yourself to the bone. That's what we're talking about here. But notice his understanding. I, I, I do labor. I'm striving, but how do I strive? How do I labor to the bone? According to his working, which works in me mightily. Do you know that a man or woman who's fully relying upon God is probably going to be a busy person? But they're not going to be doing it in their own strength. In fact, as they sit down to rest from the end of the day, where many of us just say, you know what, and, and I'm guilty of this too. It's been a long day. It's been a long week. You know, I've, I've done my ministry for the week and I just shut my cell phone off. I just shut the blinds. I get in my chair. I'm not doing anything for the Lord. I don't care if he pulled up a seat next to me in, in full blazing order. And, 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 I, 
And some of us would say, well, if he did that, I probably would. Um, <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. There are days where you're just, you've self-determined, I'm shutting it down for the day and I don't care what anybody says. I'm not taking that phone call. I'm not reaching out to that neighbor. I'm not doing this thing. I'm not doing that thing. I'll never, ever do, and I already said, you know, when you say never, ever, that's not a good thing to say. But, but we have this mindset. And, you know, I believe that what the secret that Paul learned was as God leads, I'm moving. I'm moving, Jack. And I am, and I don't care how tired I am. And I don't care how worked to the bone I am. Because you know what? The same God that's calling me out to this ministry is the same God that can give me rest. The same God who's calling me out to this ministry is the same God who can give me resources to fulfill this ministry. Now, don't take me wrong. I I believe that God, there are times where God calls us to a time of rest, where maybe that's not a lot of active service. So don't, 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 don't misunderstand me that I, if you're inactive right now for whatever stage of life that, that, that God really wants to, to activate you, you know, sometimes even Jesus took time aside, didn't he? I mean, we see that in the Gospels to recharge. But there was also times that Jesus, in response to his father, worked himself to the bone for others. There were times where Jesus just wanted to get away quietly with his disciples and invest in their lives and hear about the ministry they had just engaged in. And they couldn't, it was so busy, they couldn't even get a bite to eat. They couldn't even, he couldn't even hear their stories. He couldn't even encourage them. And so they got in a boat and they ran across the lake to an area that was uninhabited. And by the time they get there, crowds of people were waiting for him to the tune of Five to 15,000 people, depending on how you count it. 5,000 men, maybe some women, women and children. And what did Jesus do? Hey, get away. I'm trying to get with my disciples. I mean, you guys are bugging me. Get out of here. No, he says, man, they're going to need something to eat. He began to teach them. And then he provided for their physical needs. And so we see that Paul understood this, this balance. Now, when we look at uh, the negative side of this judgment, because I believe there is a negative side to the Bema Let's not ignore that. In fact, uh, we see that, that talked about in 1 Corinthians, uh, well, we saw it in, in 2 Corinthians 5, but if your finger's still in 1 Corinthians 3, um, you'll see in verse 15, excuse me, he says this phrase, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. And so there's a negative side to this, to this judgment. Um, I think part of the, the temporal loss that we find in our Christian life, and this is for any Christian who wants to live carnally, You know, I think that's a good study in and of itself. If you can't lose your salvation, what can you lose? That's a, I think that'd be an interesting study. Well, here are some, here's a list. You can lose fellowship with the Lord. And some people look at that and say, big deal. That's not a judgment. Who cares? Trust me, when you're out of fellowship with the Lord, ain't nobody going to be happy. At least of all yourself. Ain't ain't nothing going to go wrong. There's no rest When you're out of fellowship with the Lord, divine discipline can be enacted as you live and walk carnally. Loss of power production, loss of opportunities. Part of the loss of opportunities is because you're so self-focused. I'm so self-focused that we're not aware of the opportunities that God has before us, that he's set before us. And so we miss out on opportunities. We lose desire and motivation for service. You know, if you've ever served and then just been upset with how people receive the service, never thanked you enough, didn't pat you on the back enough, didn't pat your head enough, you said, you know what, forget it, I'm not doing that anymore. That's a self-serving motive. We need to go back to having an audience of one. Um, But that happens a lot of time when we're looking for self-promotion from somebody else. And so we lose desire and motivation, broken relationships, death, loss of physical health. All of these things can be temporal loss. What about eternal loss? Well, 1 Corinthians 3.15 uses this phrase, suffering loss. Um, And what we see here is because it's in the passive voice, it just means to experience forfeiture. In other words, um, you don't throw it away, but it's, it's taken from you. It's, it's like taking a good work off of this table and removing it from the scales. It's no longer going to benefit you. You, you forfeit an opportunity. As we go back, for the, back to the Ithmian games, you had one person who received their reward. What happened to the other people that participated in the event? Well, they, they didn't get whipped. They didn't get beat. They didn't get sentenced to servitude. They didn't become a slave for life. They, their loss was simply they forfeited. They did not get a reward. They didn't receive the crown. 
And so that's what we look at there. Um, We'll go to 2 Corinthians, I think, next. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, good and bad. Again, we looked at that. The good they receive back are rewards. Uh, the bad that they receive back is, is going to be uh, no rewards. Again, clearly, uh, as we've talked about before, unworthy and sinful deeds merit no rewards. So that's not even what we're dealing with there. We're talking about good works and their evaluation of acceptableness. So what they receive back for the type of good deeds, judge worthless and acceptable, is no recompense at all. They're just not going to receive anything back. Another very popular passage, and we'll move quickly, uh, is 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 27. And many people will go to this passage. This comes up um, in Africa a lot uh, as, a, as a passage where people think it teaches you can lose your salvation. Um, but I believe it's talking, again, about uh, rewards here. Verse 24 in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? What do you think Paul is alluding here, alluding to here to the church of Corinth? Well, I think he's alluding to the Ithmian games. This is, a, this is an athletic metaphor that he's using here. And he says, Only one receives the prize. Run in such a way. Notice there's a quality. You know, this isn't the YMCA. You just run a race and everyone gets a prize, right? There's a, there's a quality of running here that's, that he's talking about. And so he says, run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now, why do they do that? Why do they, they cause themselves to be temperate or why do they behave in that way? They do it to obtain a, a crown. But Paul points out it's perishable crown. They're getting a, a crown of leaves. That's what they're doing all this for. That's what they're training for. But we for an imperishable crown. Verse 26, therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Remember the Ithmian games were, were the combat. So he's, I think he's bringing that out here in this illustration. So, and what is he talking about? He's talking about living the Christian life. He runs thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. In other words, just going through the motions, just, just swinging, raining haymakers on people. Verse 27, but I discipline my body. I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. And the word disqualified means not passing the test or worthless. Now notice, he doesn't say lest when I sin, I myself become disqualified. Lest when I preach, I mean, would you normally view preaching as a good work or a sinful work? I mean, it's, I mean you normally view that as a good work, especially coming out of the, uh, the mouth of the Apostle Paul. So he's talking about di being disqualified when he does a good work. So he's talking about this, this source issue, this evaluation of his good works. And he uses preaching, I believe, as the, the extreme uh, of a good work that still has to be evaluated for source, not just going through the motions. And I'm going to move through some of these. When will it happen? Um, this is one of those things. Again, it's, it's hard to put forth probably the exact timeline. There's some things that we can key off of. I believe just in a in brief summary, it's going to happen immediately after the rapture and the resurrection of the church as described in 1 Thessalonians 4. A couple reasons for that. Revelation 4, the 24 elders who represent the church, they have crowns. Um, and that's immediately following uh, the rapture. Revelation 19, 8, when the Lord returns with his church, she's already seen as rewarded. So it happens, I believe, sometime in between those two events. And then we also see in 2 Timothy 4 and 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 5, that the rewards are associated with that day, uh, that day, that future day. So I believe it's going to happen after uh, the rapture of the church and before the second coming of the Lord. Um, and so it really brings us to our conclusion, which is this. And I don't think it, it needs to be probably overstated in this case, but your life matters to God. If, if you're a, an unbeliever here today, your life matters to God so much that Jesus died for your sins and rose again, that you simply have to put your faith in what Jesus did for you to get to heaven. It matters that much that he sent his son to pay that penalty for you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, man, we, we only have a limited time on this earth, don't we? There, there's a limited time on this earth. There's good works that God the Father has designed for you to walk in. Are you being mindful of that fact as you live your life, as you set your agenda for the day, as you walk through your daily uh, interactions with people? 
Are you aware of opportunities, human needs arising around you that you're uniquely gifted and able to meet? Do we understand that one day we're going to appear and give account for the good works and the source with which we executed those? And are we being mindful of that? That's my hope. That's, if you could ask me for my, my one hope, why did we devote nine weeks to this, is that each one of us would leave uh, the building just further encouraged, further reminded to be mindful in all that we do, really emphasizing this aspect of being in fellowship with our Lord. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, I do thank you for your word, uh, and I do uh, just appreciate, uh, and I don't think we thank you enough for all the resources you provided for us uh, to live this life in such a way that's pleasing to you. And so, uh, Lord, it's our heart's desire to, to tap into your resources, to benefit from those, uh, and to live life uh, in a pleasing way, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of our geographic locale, regardless of our, our age, regardless of our health, uh, regardless of any of those things, that we would, where you've got us planted right now, that we would desire to live a life well-pleasing to you and that we take advantage of your resources to do so. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.